It's not difficult to introduce this work, but there is a, a, a little bit of a story to tell about how we get to this. And it goes back to our strategic plan, as most things seem to go back to our strategic plan these days. The words that comes to mind when we talk about our plan, and it's not a word that I think appears in the plan all that often, but it's the word belonging. And, and that's the word that really defines what our touchstone is for redefining what schools do for kids, belonging. And when, when we, we had parents in, in November of 2017, to help us parse out that word, uh, to get us the beginning, the, the beginning planks for our strategic plan. What are the foundational ideas that would lead us to belonging? And, and there were really two things that those parents helped us see uh, back in 2017. One was that students need to have really good, really strong, really supportive relationships with each other and with us. That's number one. And number two, students need to love the work that they're doing. And not just love the work that they're doing, but be inspired by the work that they're doing. We can imagine that first one, relationships. We can imagine that. Our, our kids, I, I have a, a sort of high school age children. Uh, they have friends, they have relationships, they have favorite teachers. The love of learning and the love of the work that they do with all the homework that they do, that's tougher to imagine, but we have good work to do there that's really begun. But relationships we see as a foundational a foundational goal for us, a foundational mission for us, that to get to belonging, to find out what school spirit really means, to really develop coping and support and all the skills that we need students and your children and our children to develop, it's really about relationships, strong relationships with each other and with adults in the school. That brought us in our strategic plan to the notion of culture school culture. School culture drives those kinds of exchanges between people, relationships. School culture is pushed by what we ask people to do in schools. School culture is affected by the fact that we have a million separate rooms that we close and everybody just goes about their business and it's hard to connect. Just the very makeup of school is difficult. The sociology of school is difficult. But relationships, relationships toward culture, something that we have to work at, really strongly and dramatically and, and overtly. And that's where this work comes from. So we went looking for someone to help us with our culture, someone to give us language to talk about our culture, someone to give us the tools that we could use with kids to get to know them better, to help them cope with their challenges better, to help them understand themselves that better so that we could model better for them. And we found the Center for Great Expectations and, and Mr. Piccone. Uh, and what they've brought us is more than what we thought we were going out to look for. What they brought us was also a tool set to help our students who are in distress, a tool set for us to work with students who are dysregulated, a tool set that I go home and use with my kids and my wife and all the relationships that I have to keep myself in check so that I'm not bringing all of my frustrations to the dinner table, so that I'm not reacting in a way with my children that is just voicing my frustration and not celebrating the good that they're doing in trying to meet me in what I need. You know, there's, there's a lot of really powerful stuff here that's useful to us here, but also useful to us just in our relationships. And that's why we're really eager to bring this to you. And so tonight's a small taste of that, but uh, there's a lot more that we, that we are ready to share with you. All of this and this work on our culture toward engagement and relationships, toward belonging, we know, I mean, we, we know, we know and we must and we can and we do address the specific challenges that we face with our children, our students, your children, everybody who comes to learn here every day. We know we have to attack and we can and we do go after these specific challenges, whether we're talking about self-harm and suicide or we're talking about substance abuse or we're talking about social media addiction, we're talking about eating disorder, we know all of these things. And, and 
there is a lot of work to do on each one of those things with all of our community partners and our parents. But there's a leap of faith in this too. The leap of faith is that if we do this other thing too, this belonging, engagement, relationships thing, the leap of faith is that we'll close a lot of the gap in our work and we'll, we'll cover a lot of distance towards solving a lot of those other problems as well. And that that's sort of what school spirit is starting to mean to me anyway, is that kids grow here, they learn here, they have strong relationships here, they love, they learn to love what they're doing, they learn what they love, and then they, they are always connected to this place then as the place that helped them get to that. That's, that's what I think school spirit, it's not a rah-rah thing necessarily, but it is. But it's a place that they then always feel connected to. They're always a red devil because they left part of themselves here as they learned to become who they were. That's what it means to me. And, and so how we build that through this kind of tool set, we're excited to share that with you tonight. The other piece, and, and this is my last bit before I introduce Frank. I'm sorry, Frank, I'm taking some time from you. Um, the work we have to do together, not only as emissaries of this, but the work that we need help with. We, if we're going to do a different kind of school, we need everybody's help with that. The image I, yeah, the image I think about, and I've talked about this before, so forgive me if you've heard this metaphor, but I, I imagine us, us adults, in school, at home, wherever we are, I imagine us standing behind our kids and running. That's what I imagine. I imagine us standing behind them and with our expectations and our wishes for them and, and often all good things that we want for them, we just start running. And I worry about that. I worry that that's what we do in school. I worry that that's what I do at home. I worry that that's what our communities do. And we are taking away from them the ability to make any mistakes that aren't catastrophic. What if you stumble in that kind of scenario? You go down. You're given a choice, but you can't make that turn well, so you just keep going straight. So is that really a choice? We know you love this, but you better take that course or else you're not going to get anywhere. We do that. We do that. I know that schools do that. And we need your help because as, as a parent, I do that also. And, and I'm, I'm worried about that. I'm worried about what it means to stand behind our kids and push them. And so stepping back, learning who they are, learning how to help them in those moments that maybe we haven't prepared them well for, failure, challenge, choice, learning to show them or helping them learn who they are to, to kind of understand where their strengths and weaknesses are. I know this will trigger me, so I need to re begin to react in this way, to be mindful. That's work that we need your help with. And, and that's what I'm, I'm most excited about in this, because this is, this is the foundation of everything that we want to build through our strategic plan and, and beyond. And it starts with some simple language and some simple techniques, uh, but it begins to blossom into something much larger than that. So that's where this work is for us, and that's why it's important to us that's why we're eager to share it. Now, Frank Picconi uh, is the gentleman from the Center for Great Expectations who's worked with us, um, gosh, since February or so of last year. And uh, Frank is one of the most compelling, unique uh, presenters and consultants I've ever had the, the joy to work with. He uh, has a, a, a real skill for bringing things down to a level that we can just begin to do it and, and go. And, and he's, he's been... Uh, an incredible partner for our staff, for us, for me, uh, and it's having impacts in, in our work for your kids. We know that from our, our culture surveys and we know that from what we're seeing in, in, in some other ways. There's so much more to do. Uh, I know that so deeply, but, but this is, this is starting, uh, starting to bring us benefit that is, that is really powerful. Um, Frank uh, has worked with our entire staff, he's worked with our administrators, and we know from our culture surveys, our climate surveys, that, that parents and kids need and want more of this information as well. Uh, so that's, that's also why I'm excited tonight to be able to bring Frank to you uh, and through our, our taping to everyone 
who can join us uh, online um, down the road. So without any more of that, uh, I'm going to ask Frank to come up and start his work with us tonight. Thank you again for joining us tonight. You're in for, for something really great. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Hi, everybody. So here's my first message to all of you. I am impressed, and, uh, and you, the fact that you're here, and I have this suspicion that you have other things that you could be doing uh, at home, relaxing, uh, being with your family, and you came here to a talk about the great things that are happening here at the high school, and the fact that now we want to bring it to the parents and be true partners with them. So I see dedication in the parents and the educators that are here. I see a commitment and I better get on with it because Jeff ate up a lot of my time. <laughs> Only kidding. So the Center for Great Expectations is where I'm from. A uh, little bit of, but Qatari is our school-based division. Uh, and basically, uh, I want you to know a little bit about me. Um, I've been working for about 30 years in residential treatment centers and school systems, um, helping to change the cultures, helping to build resilience, helping to teach social emotional learning skills, and together with the Center for Great Expectations, which is an awesome organization, we, together, we have about 50 years of experience together. The Center for Great Expectations has all kinds of services, outpatient services, residential services, supportive housing services, and a tremendous knowledge of working with trauma, working with stress, working with substance use issues. And we decided to collaborate together, my years of experience and the center, to begin to work in schools because we are committed to the young people and to helping transform schools because we think there's a lot of work to be done and there's a lot of concern. So um, I have been in probably over 100 schools in the past 10 years and I have to say that I am thoroughly impressed with Hunterton Central Regional High School um, and the dedicated staff that are here. They passionately want to strive to be the best for their kids in every way and it's just a, a, a pleasure to be collaborating. So what I'm gonna be doing today, tonight, in a, and, and doing it pretty rapidly, is talking about what the challenges are for our youth today in terms of some statistics. I'm gonna talk about stress. I'm gonna talk about the damaging effects of stress. And then I'm gonna talk about the work that we've done since last February. And I'm gonna get through that pretty, I'm gonna get through that pretty rapidly and then I'm going to talk about an opportunity for any of the parents out there that want to, to join up into some classes, some three session classes, where we get into this in more depth and we can apply this to your lives and to your families. Because I think it's, a, I, I just know that this is something that I've used in my life. And I have to tell you, after I worked with the staff here, um, they came back and immediately talked, immediately used with the knowledge and the approaches with their families and came back with fantastic stories. So it's so affirming. This is such a valid way to go forward in building tougher, stronger kids in the, on the inside who, who believe in themselves and see their talents. Being a parent can be stressful and being a student can be stressful and being a teacher can be stressful. And so I'm gonna just share with you landmark research called the ACE study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences. And I want you to think about, the, I want you to think about a couple things when you're watching this four, five minute video. It's, it, think about the population they did this study on and think about the connection between early childhood stress and getting every major disease and illness and bad behavioral pattern possible. What does your parents' divorce have to do with your risk for heart disease? If your mother had a drinking problem when you were growing up, are you more likely to suffer from depression as an adult? Here's what you should know about ACEs. ACEs stand for Adverse Childhood Experiences. 
extremely stressful events that can happen to a child growing up. Some experiences are so stressful that they can alter brain development as well as the immune system, increasing the risk of lifelong health and social problems in adulthood. The term comes from the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, landmark research that shed new light on the root cause of everything from stroke and liver disease to substance abuse and mental illness. In the late 1990s, an epidemiologist from the Centers for Disease Control and a preventive medicine doctor at Kaiser Permanente set out to understand the association between childhood experience and lifelong health. They asked over 17,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan in San Diego about their health history, as well as difficult questions about their experiences growing up. Anda and Felitti tallied up 10 different kinds of adversity in this largely middle-class and college-educated population. They were stunned to see how common ACEs were. 21% of all respondents were sexually abused as children. 19% grew up with someone who suffered mental illness. 28% had been physically abused. And two out of three respondents had experienced at least one ACE. The researchers next looked at how someone's ACE score, or the number of adversities they experienced, related to a wide array of serious health and social problems. They saw that the more ACEs someone had, the greater their risk for poor outcomes compared with someone with no ACEs. Someone with an ACE score of four had twice the risk of heart disease and cancer. Someone with an ACE score of five had an eight times greater chance of being an alcoholic. And those with an ACE score of six or more, on average, died 20 years earlier. With every major problem they looked at in the ACE study, the risk went up for each additional adverse experience in childhood. As Dr. Robert Anda says, what's predictable is preventable. It's important to remember that ACEs are not destiny. ACEs are a tool for understanding the health of a population as a whole. For individuals, an ACE score can be a tool for understanding their own risk for health and social problems and empower them to make changes for themselves and their children. ACEs tend to get passed down from generation to generation and are common across all income levels, races, and cultures. But increasingly, people of all different professions and backgrounds are coming together to discuss how ACEs affect their communities. They're finding new ways to treat and prevent ACEs. Many doctors are starting to screen their patients for ACEs as part of their medical history. More schools are becoming trauma-informed, considering the source of problem behavior when disciplining their students instead of immediately suspending or expelling them. To learn more about interrupting the cycle of adversity and improving health and well-being for the next generation, please visit kpjrfilms.co. I'm uh, going to show you some statistics that are a little sobering, but before we talk about that, is it a surprise to anybody that a lot of stress, stressful events, common stressful events in childhood are correlated with people becoming addicted to drugs or smoking or getting cancer? Does that make sense? Any thoughts on why? Why would stressful experiences growing up make you more likely to have to 
become have one of these social problems or have medical all kinds of medical problems from liver disease to COPD. Any anybody want to take a shot at that? Central nervous system is compromised, and and also your immune system is compromised. Stress makes you less able to fight off many of the diseases that are lurking out there in some of our genetic backgrounds. But the population was well-educated people working for Kaiser Permanente with you know, mostly white, middle class, well-educated, good health insurance. 28% of them had been, had been physically abused. 21% of them had been sexually abused. So this, is, uh, this study has been replicated hundreds of times. Stress is a killer and we have to master it. We have, we're never gonna have stressful, stressless lives. And our kids are never gonna have stress without, live without stress. So we have to become good at it because it's debilitating. And 61% of teachers report being stressed out. 58% of teachers say their mental health is not good. Public schools educators are quitting their jobs at the highest rate on record. Nearly one in three adolescents will meet the criteria for an anxiety disorder by the age of 18. 33% having anxiety disorders. 46% of all children in the U.S. have experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. Think of the billions of dollars and more importantly the lives that we would transform if we could raise children without a lot of adverse childhood experiences or with less of them and help build that resilience. On average, U.S. teens spend nine hours a day on digital entertainment, not practicing real social skills, but practicing you know, virtual relationships, which is not the practice that many of us had growing up, which just builds resilience. Nearly 40% of high school seniors report that they feel lonely and left out. 21% of high school students report binge drinking in the past 30 days, 21%. There's 4,300 deaths each year because of drinking, over drinking, 119,000 emergency room visits, 4,000 adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 every day are trying drugs for the first time. And the epidemic of suicide. In 2017, there were 6,200 suicide deaths among adolescents and young adults. In 2017, 1,400,000 suicide attempts. U.S. youth suicide reaches an all-time high in nearly two decades. 50.6% of suicide deaths caused by guns. I mean, I'm just going to skip them because I just, it's very sobering. It's very sobering. So what do we do about this? There's a lot that we need to do, but the most important thing we can do is build resilience in our kids and help them to manage stress more effectively. But in order to do that, we have to help the adults that are caring for them in school and at home to manage their stress effectively so they can think with their full brain, where they can think with the best parts of their brain. It's really, it's not, I'm not trying to oversimplify the problem, but what do we do? I think our kids are more fragile than ever. They, they, they don't seem to be able to manage a lot of the stress, um, and I think that we have to do something. And what we've what we've partnered with Hunterton Central about is how do we begin to build that resiliency, and how do we be, begin to help ourselves to manage our own stress so that we could be there for the kids. I'm going to show you a quick video of some of what we're going for in terms of the concept of attunement. You had so much to offer yesterday. You okay? Oh, I'm tired. So what's going on? Strong relationships are central to the learning process. What the science of learning and development tells us is that we need to create learning environments which allow for strong long-term relationships for children to become attached to school and to the adults and other children in it. When children have experiences of closeness and consistency and trust, oxytocin is released. Oxytocin has many, many positive effects on the development 
of the brain. So when we think about a relationship, we're not just talking about being nice to a child. We're talking about a child having an experience of attunement and trust strong enough to release the hormone oxytocin. Good morning, Ariella. How you doing today? The purpose of the morning greeting is to connect with them and to just make sure that I'm seeing them as humans. Like, I'm making that relationship with them, making that bond. I prioritize relationship building because getting to know them is the best part of the job. When I come in in the morning, we usually talk about things that are happening in our community. We're trying to build caring and respect. The teacher is trying to understand who I am and my values as a person. When I have a free 45 minutes or an hour, I think to myself, I could sit down and catch up on Grady, or I could go and make connections, whether it's a smile or a joke or a reminder. It validates their presence in the building. Rock it out in the art room. It starts from so much honesty and transparency with kids. It's really easy to strive to be this like idealized, always ready to go elementary school teacher, and that's not real and that's not human. When people start talking about other things while I'm still giving directions, it feels frustrating for me and I have to take a breath. My students connect most with me when they see that I also struggle and I also have challenges. It takes a lot of vulnerability on my part. Total familiarity. When that student knows that you care about them, when they know that you're a human, Let's think about that. their academic performance in your class is going to be better. If I'm comfortable around them, then I'm more confident around them, and it's easier to ask questions and things like that. So when you're looking at this graph, what is it that you think happened? Some teachers I don't always get along with the best, so then sometimes I'm like, I can't do it, so I'm just not going to do it. But when I like the teacher, I want to do their work. I'll be like, I can learn this. You all have done outstanding work. Emotion and learning are completely connected. <laughs> if you're in a positive emotional space, if you feel good about yourself, your teacher, that actually opens up the opportunity for more learning. Good to see you. Uh, um, my favorite person in there is uh, that teacher that goes, you know, when you're talking and while I'm trying to talk, it really stresses me out. And this is really the cornerstone of it. I see so many parents and their kids, and I see so many teachers and their kids, and I watched myself with my two sons as they were growing up. I was in an escalated state. And in an escalated state, I'm not living my best parenting. I'm not living it at all. And I see escalated people who love each other hurting each other. I see escalated people who want to open up lines of communication, shutting down communications. And it's because we're not at our best when we have cortisol shooting through our body and we're all escalated. So the biggest thing that we started with here at Hunterton was talking to teachers about being honest and modeling. My favorite thing in the world is a teacher who says to their students, I'm really stressing out right now because I'm asking for cooperation. I have to continually talk to you about stopping talking and it's really frustrating me. So you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take a moment and regulate myself and I'm gonna calm myself down and get into a better space so that I can be a better teacher for you. And I'm gonna ask that maybe some of you join me in breathing and calming down. I've seen that in schools, I've seen that here, and the kids love it because they see adults have the same stress we do, and they're using these techniques to get themselves into a better mode. So many times I would have had better interactions with my son who was ADHD and still is, and very challenging, and I wish I would have just said, I'm upset, but I'm gonna take a break and get myself into a better mind space because this is a challenging kid and I need to be there for him, not in my escalated state. And that's really what it's about. How are we at regulating ourselves? It's about attunement. I love this word, maybe because I'm a musician, but I love the idea of watching adults who are calm and well-regulated, then attuning to a, a youth 
and being there for the youth and recognizing what they need and then dealing with it in an effective way. I think so much of us, so many of us love our children, we love our students, but because we're escalated, we're not in the right space to be able to show that love in the right way. We're not living intentional ways. And I love this word, bringing into harmony to make aware or responsive. We want parents who are helping their children grow and modeling good regulation. There's no greater gift that you can give your child than helping them to regulate their emotional state to optimize their brain, which is beautifully ready to operate. But if you stay in an escalated state, all you get is fight or flight. All you get is fight or flight. And that's not the best, that's good for a crisis, but it's not really the best. So when you're attuned, we have attuned relationships with our students, we can accurately and empathetically understand them, and then we can be responsive to them. When, we have attuned, when we're regulated, it requires teachers to be fully aware of their emotional state and have the ability to regulate that state. And resiliency is the ability to recover from or adjust easily to adversity or change. You don't have to answer this, but how many of you see your children, your students, your youth responding effectively and adjusting and adapting beautifully and quickly to adversity? I really think that we're, we have to get better at this, and it starts with regulation. And we're also teaching social-emotional skills. I put this up there because we keep hearing SEL, social-emotional learning. What is that? That's the, the basis, the foundation for resiliency. How good are our kids at understanding and managing their emotions? How good are our kids at feeling and showing empathy for others? I can tell you, bullying, virtual, cyberbullying is big because we, we, our kids are crushing each other emotionally, but they're not seeing the face of the person who they're crushing. They're not having that real experience because it's all virtual. They're just typing and then crushing the spirit of another person. In the old days when I was in school, um, when, you, when somebody was bullying somebody, they might have seen the person start to cry or start to get upset and empathy might have found its way into their heart and they might have realized this is another human being like me. But with, with cyberbullying, it's not gonna happen. We want our kids to make responsible decisions, weigh pros and cons. Do cost-benefit analysis about the things you're doing. Pause and think things through. We want to establish and maintain positive relationships, and we want them to set and achieve positive goals. So this is all going to happen in a calm, well-regulated brain, not an escalated brain, not a student that's worried about losing their boyfriend or girlfriend, not a student that's feeling like I'm not worthwhile if I don't get into the right college. Not a student, that's, we're not gonna teach these beautiful resilient skills that will make them strong for the rest of their lives and be able to withstand a lot of the challenges, most of the challenges of life. So this is the whole program that we instituted in a nutshell here and that a, a year ago in uh, this February will be a year that we've been working. We want our teachers and our students to learn how stress affects themselves and their students. We teach about trauma, chronic stress, toxic stress, brain functioning. We want to learn strategies to regulate the effects of stress to optimize our brains for learning. Our frontal cortex is fantastic. It learns, it helps us with social emotional decision making, it helps us make good decisions, it helps us do all kinds of things. But when we get stressed, cortisol shoots up in the body, turns off the frontal cortex, and now we've got the amygdala running the show. Now the amygdala is the 911 center of the brain. It says there's an emergency, get ready to fight, get ready to run, because it's danger. It's, not, it's good for primal survival, but I don't know, have any of you think, ever encountered somebody who you think their amygdala was calling the shots? They, they, somebody who wants to fight, somebody who wants to battle because they're not using the best part of their brain. If we get our kids to use the best part of their brain, they'll make much better decisions. They'll learn social emotional skills. And that's what we're trying to do. But we're not gonna do it with escalated teachers. 
We're not going to do it with escalated parents, and we're not going to do it with escalated kids. I'm not saying we have to walk around like monks and meditate all the time. What I'm saying is, I, I'll tell you a real quick story. I, uh, I do a lot of talks every year, but every once in a while, I, this happens. I got a call. I was in the shower on a day off relaxing and having a nice relaxing morning, looking forward to the day, and I got a phone call. Frank, where are you? Our, my whole school is it waiting for you. And I'm like, oh my God, I forgot about a talk. I said, where are you? And that didn't make her happy, that I didn't know where she was. And she said, I'm here, she was, it was North Jersey, I knew it was an hour and 15 minutes away, and her whole staff was waiting there, and it was the start time. So my cortisol was shooting through my body, my heart rate was beating like crazy. I grabbed some clothes, I ran into my car, and as I was sitting, I looked at my hands and they were shaking. And I said, look at the state you're in right now. Is this a state to drive on the highways of New Jersey? I think there's other people driving like that too. And I said to myself, I better regulate my emotions and get myself calm. So I did my deep breathing and I had long exhales and my heart rate began to drop and I began to relax and get things into perspective and I, and I drove safely. I saved my life maybe because I regulated my emotions. But many of us go charging into relationships with kids we love with cortisol calling the shots, with amygdala calling the shots. Many of us are talking to our spouses and our loved ones that we want to spend the rest of our life with, and we're saying things later that we're like, who was that person? If we're going to get to be the best versions of ourselves, the adults have to get regulated and make it a priority so that we can use the best parts of our brains, and we need to model this and teach this to our kids, and then teach them this most social-emotional skills. That's the idea. Last year, the Qatari Institute and, and Hunterton got together. We created an impact steering committee. You see, our philosophy is we need to build an expert team at the school, built with teachers, administrators, social workers, counselors, and teach them about emotional regulation, teach them about the zones of regulation, teach them about the nurture heart approach. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna tell you about all these wonderful, powerful tools. And we did this for three days. The entire 19 people, including uh, Dr. Moore, uh, were on the impact steering committee. And the reason I wanted that team is because we're building a team that's gonna keep going after we're gone to perpetuate this initiative and to perpetuate this safe and caring and attuned school. So we built that team. Then on March 11th the year, we trained every single staff member in the school in one day on what we taught the team in three days. Then we built a team of teachers that were gonna let us walk into their classrooms, let me walk into their classrooms and watch them and see if they were using the regulation skills, see if they were using the nurtured heart approach, see if they were using attunement, and then pull them out of class and meet with them for 20 minutes to 30 minutes and coach them and support them and help them digest. You know, I do a lot of trainings in the past and I leave schools and they go, we loved what you did, Frank, we loved the concepts. And I come back six months later and they're not using them because it's hard because stress makes us do go back to the, you know, like hamsters on a wheel instead of trying out these techniques. Well, Hunterton said, we don't just want you to train this team. We don't want you to just train the staff, but we want you to go into the classrooms and watch the teachers and support them and not criticize them, but build their competencies in these skills. And what a beautiful experience that has been. Probably to date, I've probably seen maybe 50 te different teachers in their classrooms. And then, so that's the model. So I already talked about the impact steering committee. That's the leadership of the school, and that's teachers all being a team that goes out and models and supports all the people they supervise to use the skills from the training. And then we had the all staff meeting, which went great. I just want to tell you, the teachers at the school, the team said to me, they're never going to tolerate an all-day training in the cafeteria, in the uh, auditorium, right? They, they don't like the auditorium. It's not, they, 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 you better move them around or something. At the end of the training, they said they couldn't believe how fast the time went because 
it was not just speaking to how they can work with the students, it was speaking to how they wanted to work with their families. It was speaking to how they wanted to live their lives. That's what's so beautiful about this. This isn't a school technique. This is a, do you want to raise a healthy human being who can deal with stress, who loves themselves, can identify their strengths, and is always pointing out the strengths in others? Then this is the philosophy. So we got through that day. This is the impact deployment team. These were the teachers that volunteered to, go, to let us come into their classrooms, and we're continuing that this year. And then I did the classroom observations, and then I coached the team. Why did I build this expert team? Well, first of all, they represented every discipline in the school, so they would go out to their staff meetings and model and coach on how to be nurtured hard, how to be attuned. And I had some fabulous, many fabulous conversations with teachers. Some teachers saying, I recognized myself getting escalated with a kid, and I just took a couple of deep breaths, and it made a fantastic difference. And the kids are now practicing this as well. Being well-regulated is a beautiful feeling. You feel in control. You're living your intentional life. It's just awesome. And then we did all kinds of uh, special trainings. And I met with the staff, and we talked about all kinds of different trainings. If we thought they needed a little more work on this, we did a little more work on that. And then we measured. We did pre and post surveys. We used the climate survey that many of you parents and teachers completed. And, and you know, Jeff pulled out some questions. And we saw the needle moving in the right areas. We checked on their nurtured heart attitudes. We checked on their stress and trauma recognition. And all of those needles moved. But more, more importantly than that, we heard story after story of classrooms using new approaches and seeing real results of connectedness and attuneness, attunement. That's year one. We're now moving into year two, and we're going to continue to do the classroom observations. We're going to continue to consult with the Impact Steering Committee, the Culture Change Committee of the school. We continue to meet with administrators, because they've got to supervise their staff with the model, or the staff are not going to feel the genuine authenticity of the approach. Year two, which is what we're heading into now, we need to re we're now starting groups with the students. In various parts of the school, we're teaching them how to recognize their stress, how to practice stress management, using the nurtured heart, using the zones of regulation, using all these techniques, building resiliency, building social emotional learning skills. We're running those groups, and we're also now offering this training series, this series for parents, which we hope some of you take us up on, which I will not be zipping through really fast. We'll dig into it. We'll bring examples from your families and from situations that are going on where we can apply this and coach you through using these. So that wouldn't that be awesome if the school's using these approaches, the parents are using these approaches, and we're all telling each other stories of seeing better versions of ourselves, more success, seeing the qualities we want to grow in our kids growing. That's the idea of, this, of these classes. The idea is education works best when all the parts are working. The students are practicing the approaches. They're being more attuned. They're listening to each other more. They're managing their stress more effectively. They're learning problem solving skills and social emotional skills. The teachers are modeling it, and the parents are modeling it and using it, and we're all feeling a lot better about things. So this is the three session class that we're, classes that we're, we're talking about. Number one, learning to manage stress and optimize our brains, bodies, and parenting strategies. I'll tell you, when I, before I became a parent, I have this on video. My wife and I, at the time, we, we did a video of all the intentions. We weren't going to let our kids eat junk food. We weren't going to let them watch TV. We were going to be, give them wholesome, only, only National Geographic on, you know, on TV. They weren't going to play video games. We all have these great intentions, and then we get into the thick of parenting, and we suddenly do things that we said we'd never do, and we start doing things that we hated that our parents did. I think it's hard to live your intentions when your amygdala is driving the bus. It helps to have yourself in a calm state to say, 
I'm in line with my intentions or I'm out of line with my intentions. We don't really think about those things when we're, it's 3 o'clock in the morning and our 17-year-old hasn't showed up to their 10 o'clock curfew. Our amygdala is saying, I'm going to kill them. I'm, I'm going to kill them. I'm, I'm really worried about them. Wouldn't the best thing when that child, when that teenager walks in the door, the best thing for that parent would be to say, I'm really angry. I'm really upset with you. But in the state I'm in right now, this is not going to be a productive conversation. So we're going to go to bed. We're going to wake up. We're going to have a conversation. And that conversation might really get the message across that you can't do this. I love you. I can't be treated like this and you can't make me worry like this and you need to make better decisions, that message will be heard and validated by a calmer kid and a more intentional parent. But most of us would say in that moment, I'm wailing on them. And then I, as a, out, when I was doing outpatient therapy, a lot of the families I worked with were dealing with the damage done when amygdalas drive the bus. The second thing we want to do is understand the power of our inner voice and the importance of a growth mindset. Have you heard of that phrase? Growth mindset. I was talking to your kids today in school about growth versus fixed mindset. Here's a fixed mindset. I can't do math. Here's a growth mindset. I struggle with math, but I need to study more, and I need some tutoring, and I know I can do better. What we tell ourselves in our brain, in our inner voice, is so powerful. And I worked, and I, and I wish somebody would have told me this when I was, before I became a parent, because in my worst moments, I said some things that have found their way into my two adult son head that I wish I could take out. And it's, it was all with best intentions. So our inner voice, we have to go, change it from a fixed mindset. I can't do this. I'm no good. Nobody loves me. I'm, I'm, I'm not good enough. I can't handle this. I don't know how to handle stress. I'm never going to get a boyfriend. I'm never going to get a girlfriend. These statements are your mind's way of really messing you up. And how do we change the inner voice in our kids? We change it because the inner voice is created by what we say to them. And what we say to them in dysregulated states is not what you want in your kid's head long after you're gone. We don't want that. You all agree that the voice that talks to you in your head, do you all have a voice that talks to you in your head? Because if I'm the only one, <laughs> right? Sometimes it keeps you up at night. You want to go to bed, and it just keeps talking to you. Sometimes it's nice to you. Yeah, Frank, you're a pretty good speaker. You tell good stories. You're engaging. I like that voice. And then sometimes it's like, Frank, you can't fix mechanical things. Men are supposed to be able to fix the plumbing and the electric in the house. You don't know how to do it. Stop trying. How many times do you have to get electrocuted? I mean, stop it. You're incompetent. We all have voices that speak to us, and that's not us. That's, we're the ones listening to it. That's our past experiences condemning us to repeat our failures. The greatest gift you can give is help your kids have a positive inner voice, and we're going to talk about how to do that with the Nurtured Heart approach. Do I want to show this video? Yes, I do. I want to show you some of the biology. It's about five minutes, and then I'll wrap up. Are you sleeping restlessly, feeling irritable or moody, forgetting little things, and feeling overwhelmed and isolated? Don't worry. We've all been there. You're probably just stressed out. Stress isn't always a bad thing. It can be handy for a burst of extra energy and focus like when you're playing a competitive sport or have to speak in public. But when it's continuous, the kind most of us face day in and day out, it actually begins to change your brain. Chronic stress, like being overworked or having arguments at home, can affect brain size, its structure, and how it functions, right down to the level of your genes. Stress begins with something called the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, a series of interactions between endocrine glands in the brain and on the kidney, which controls your body's reaction to stress. When your brain detects a stressful situation, your HPA axis is instantly activated and releases a hormone called cortisol, which primes your body for instant action. But high levels of cortisol over long periods of time wreak havoc on your brain. For example, 
Chronic stress increases the activity level and number of neural connections in the amygdala, your brain's fear center. And as levels of cortisol rise, electric signals in your hippocampus, the part of the brain associated with learning, memories, and stress control, deteriorate. The hippocampus also inhibits the activity of the HPA axis, so when it weakens, so does your ability to control your stress. That's not all, though. Cortisol can literally cause your brain to shrink in size. Too much of it results in the loss of synaptic connections between neurons and the shrinking of your prefrontal cortex, the part of your brain that regulates behaviors like concentration, decision-making, judgment, and social interaction. It also leads to fewer new brain cells being made in the hippocampus. This means chronic stress might make it harder for you to learn and remember things, and also set the stage for more serious mental problems like depression and eventually Alzheimer's disease. The effects of stress may filter right down to your brain's DNA. An experiment showed that the amount of nurturing a mother rat provides its newborn baby plays a part in determining how that baby responds to stress later in life. The pups of nurturing moms turned out less sensitive to stress because their brains developed more cortisol receptors, which stick to cortisol and dampen the stress response. The pups of negligent moms had the opposite outcome and so became more sensitive to stress throughout life. These are considered epigenetic changes, meaning that they affect which genes are expressed without directly changing the genetic code. And these changes can be reversed if the moms are swapped. But there's a surprising result. The epigenetic changes caused by one single mother rat were passed down to many generations of rats after her. In other words, the results of these actions were inheritable. It's not all bad news, though. There are many ways to reverse what cortisol does to your stressed brain. The most powerful weapons are exercise and meditation, which involves breathing deeply and being aware and focused on your surroundings. Both of these activities decrease your stress and increase the size of the hippocampus, thereby improving your memory. So don't feel defeated by the pressures of daily life. Get in control of your stress before it takes control of you. So there's a bunch of concepts um, that I am running out of time to explain. That's what, uh, kind of a, I would like you to come to the class so we could spend our time on them. One of the concepts is zones of regulation. Have you ever been in a blue zone where you're lethargic or not focused or hazy? Have you ever seen your kids in these zones? Have you ever been in a green zone, happy, focused, calm, ready to learn? You know, th that's the best zone to be in for everything. Well, not really. If you're really about to go to bed, the blue zone's a good zone to be in. The green zone is the gr green zone where we want to we want to grow the great skills. We want to deal. We want to push the student a little more, push the youth a little more, because they're in a great mind space to be challenged. The yellow zone is when they're getting anxious and stressed, and the and the red zone is when we're losing control. I see so many teachers that are, are dealing with students in the red zone or the yellow zone, and they're sitting down with the student and they're saying you really have to understand that you can't keep doing this. What does an amygdala say to somebody who's telling them they can't keep doing this? Because the amygdala is calling the shots at this point. The amygdala says, blank you. And the teacher or the administrator says, how could you speak to me like that? We're starting to recognize that before we have conversations with students, we want to make sure we're in the green zone and we get them into the green zone because we're going to have productive conversations where we learn and grow. So learning what zone your kids are in. One of the teachers in one of the schools that I was in taught the kids about the four zones of regulation of the brain. And then they gave out, they said, write on a piece of paper what zone you're in. There were 31 students in the class. 29 of them wrote yellow. And the, and, the teacher, and the teacher said, what are you so stressed out about? And then they began to tell her, my boyfriend broke up with me. My brother just started, is, is, has a heroin ad addiction. My parents are getting a divorce. I'm not going to be able to get into this college and my life is over. 
and without asking these questions, without tuning into our kids, we don't know what, what, what's going on for them. So that's the zones of regulation. At this point, I'm just going to close and say thank you, um, and um, we'll, uh, we'll, get, we'll move on to the next section in a bit.